Welcome to this special uh, edition of the Bug Scope, everybody. This is Issa, your host, and I'm joined today by my housemate, biologist, evolutionary biologist, Georgia, and also her mom, Rebecca. So good morning. Good morning, Issa. Good morning. Yeah. Where are you guys uh, coming to us from so everybody can know? Yeah, so normally I live in Michigan with Issa, but I'm visiting my mom for her birthday. Um, she, we're, so we're in Indiana right now, in central Indiana. Happy birthday, Rebecca. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Um, so yeah, welcome everybody. Hope you guys all had a great weekend. Make sure you say hello in the chat and let us know where you're watching from as well. Um, hello. We have some people coming in now. Hello, Perplorine. Uh, welcome to the broadcast. And the Med Watcha. Hope you guys are well. Yeah, so today we're looking at uh, my favorite insect. So yay. And I'm even wearing, here I'll make my screen a little bigger. We have the mic. So currently the layout you see, we have the scope ready to take a look at the golden tortoise beetle. But we haven't brought it out yet. And I'll explain why in a moment. But first, um, I'll show, I'm will i going to show off this necklace that one of the bug scope viewers, um, Amy, Iverson, uh, who's an artist, made me several years ago, and it has like mm. the golden tortoise beetle on it. Oh, oh, cool! Actually, maybe I ought to just put it under the scope. Maybe that's yeah. an easier way to show everybody. <laughs> One second. Hi, David. How's it going? Hi, Robert Van Buren. Welcome to the broadcast. So here's the golden tortoise beetle um, enamel. Oh, it doesn't even fit under here, but you can see all the beautiful detail this way, at least. Oh, wow. Um, so this is what we're about to look at, but we're about to look at a live one. Um, and the scientific name is even on here as well. Charidotella sexpunctata. And then on the back, she even added the detail of including um, a little cutout of the host plant for this insect, which is uh, in which is morning glory or members of the plant family Convalaceae. So, and then right here, just so I can give her proper attribution is her little symbol, 1500 degree studio artwear. Um, so yeah, it's been a very special thing to have and uh, I love wearing it. So Issa, did she choose to make you a golden, golden tortoise shell beetle necklace because you like love are they going like your favorite insects or something or special to you in some way? Yep. Yeah, that's why. I talked about it a lot and even had a colony in the earlier days of hosting the bug scope. And so she got inspired to make this and send it to me. So it was really nice. Yeah. I, I like had a smile on my face for like the whole entire week when I got it. Like totally unexpected. So hi Peter, how's it going? Hi Diana. Hope you guys are well. Um yeah, so it's a it's it's one of those beetles. Here, I'll take it out so we can look at it as we talk about it, and so I can show you guys. And um, it's a nice beetle to look at on a birthday weekend <laughs> or extended birthday weekend, since today's yeah, Monday. Happy true. Monday, everybody! Okay, so. There's two of them here, and they're on opposite sides of the leaf, but we'll just start on this side. So here's our little, let me get, get it in focus. Wait, why is it? That's so cool. So here's our little tortoise beetle friend. I'll see if I can make it flat, because this is not flat. Look at the other one, maybe. Or actually, I need to clip off a piece of this leaf so that it's not. That it's, I think this one's already changing color. So, one moment here. Oh, yeah. So, tell us about it's like, what do you mean they're changing color? Yeah. So, the claim to fame here, it is changing color, is that they're the fastest reversibly color changing beetle or arthropod, sorry, not beetle, arthropod known to man. And they can change, the literature says that they can change as fast as. 12 seconds has been recorded. This one's changing pretty fast. In, um, is this in, let's, let me get it a little more in focus. Oops. Oh, yeah. 
Yeah, that's good. That's better. Okay, so cool. It's, no, it's not changing to look like the leaf, right? It's changing to be red. Like, yes, yeah. yeah. So it's changing to bring um, an aposomatic coloration. Yeah. Thanks for the happy mm -hmm. birthday award to celebrate George's mm -hmm. mom's birthday. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. So. Um, yeah, so normally they're bright golden, like the color of gold. And actually I have, well, I, I didn't, I should have brought some gold on here with me today. Um, <laughs> someone wants to send a golden nugget to me um, so we can compare properly. Let me know. I'll give you an address. <laughs> but they are, they are like totally golden, like, uh, like gold, shiny, beautiful insects. And then when they get disturbed, they change um, into a red coloration. And this is caused by a really unique process where there's humidity between their exoskeleton layers. And when they suck out the humidity with these pores in, their in the structure of their body, it reveals the red layer. So mm -hmm. when the humidity is in between those ex uh, exoskeleton layers, it's golden. It forms that reflectance, which causes the gold that you see. Mm -hmm. And then um, I feel like this one's not totally going all the way red. Maybe well, I'll I was, poke it to bother it some more. <laughs> well, I was going to say too, like maybe so can the degree to which they can change color or like how fast it happens, that must depend on like the ambient humidity around them in the air, right? Maybe. Yeah. Um, I don't know if it's that's totally known too, but yeah, uh, the the ambient temperature i think undoubtedly probably makes a difference just because of insect metabolism it so heavily relies on ambient temperature and rather than they don't create their own heat and so let me put the other one in the frame too if i can swing it as a comparison oops mm. Wait, let me take out make it a flatter leaf too okay um and one thing that's yeah so here we go uh, they won't be on the same focal plane, unfortunately, but um, let me get it back in focus. Okay. So the ones in focus, the other one won't be in focus just because they're on different levels. And as you zoom in to the macro, the insect world, that depth of field is gets very thin. Um, yeah, my, my mom... Um Oh yeah, I always use the example of like when you use the macro lens on your on your camera, or you know when you try to take a macro picture, you only like a very thin bit is in, in focus. But um, my mom just asked if the other one was making it turn more red, or like is it just it sensed more disturbance around it, so it's turning uh, more. Red. Yeah. Um, it looks more red now. Yeah, it does look more red now. Yeah, hard to say exactly, but I'm guessing those are the reasons why probably the shifting around and the bright light shining down on it. And um, thanks everyone for the Golden Squirrel Award. I guess this is probably one of the best <laughs> bug bro broadcasts for that to play in. <laughs> um, hello, Georgie, welcome to the broadcast. Uh, what's the bubble around them? Great question. So that is their exoskeleton. One thing that's super cool about insects that, I, I don't know, maybe Georgia can answer if it happens in mammals much, or, but their exoskeleton can come in many different shapes and colors, even a transparent coloration. So that's just an extension of its exoskeleton, um, and it's clear, and it helps to break up the body shape, which makes it, um, which can help just with, like, uh, like defense and also with not being seen because then it just helps make it harder for other animals to understand like what's going on and where the edge of it is and it helps with causing miscalculations among predators or other um, antagonistic organisms yeah uh, yeah it looks like it looks kind of like a jelly yeah but what's what's so cool about that that clear part is that you can you can see through to its feet a little bit and you can also see through to its antenna. I'll see if I can focus down. They're on its feet and antenna are on a different focal plane. So I'll see if we can focus down through the exoskeleton to see, so we can really appreciate that um, that transparency. And then I'll zoom in too. Yeah, the biggest animal I know of that gets transparent is like. Well, I guess there's some pretty big jellyfish. 
But there's, I think also squid can do that, some squid. Ooh. Whoa, this is so cool. They look kind of glittery up close. Kind of scary, you said? Glittery. Oh, glittery, glittery. Oh, yeah, okay. Yeah. Um, I'm fighting with my phone here. My phone tries to refocus as I refocus. But I'll see how close I can go. Whoops. You can see it twitching its antenna. Yeah, I was going to say, I can see a ton of detail on its antenna right now. And so this yeah. is its head. Yeah, we can even see its eyes through the exoskeleton. And one thing to note, too, is that the um, insect eyes do have clear exoskeleton on them, too. The whole insect is covered in exoskeleton. So they it's like, not like goggles. <laughs> yeah. Safety yeah. goggles. <laughs> Yeah, you can even see the little, um, I'll zoom in even more to the maximum, at least for this scope. Um, you can see well, the like little facets of the, of the um, exoskeleton as well. Like you can see kind of almost the individual cells, which is pretty cool. So yeah, we're looking right through two layers of, at least two layers of exoskeleton here. One through its, its um, uh, I guess it, is it coming. It's from coming from the thorax. I think it's. I think it's its pronotum. It's thorax exoskeleton, which comes over the top. It's kind of has a hooded head, and then I think that's how it's arranged. And then um, also through the cuticle that's on top of its eye, and there it is moving its antenna around. Sometimes, so part of why it's like this. I mean, you might be able to guess from the way it looks and from the way it has this kind of shell over top of its body. That's what gives it the tortoise in the golden tortoise beetle um, and so they can really hunker down on the leaf like a little tank to keep any pesky ants or other insects that are trying to bother it or get to it um, at bay oh, so cool. that's also partially why it's it's formed almost like a like a hard helmet hard hat or hard helmet of some kind um, yeah, looks looks how our skin is too. Yeah, so you can see like all the different um, like I think that each of those each of those um, like circles you see in the clear area sort of represent cells, I believe. I was gonna say that would be my guess as well. Yeah, so it's cool to see it that way. Um, I'll move around so you can see other parts. You can kind of see. Like, I, I like how it, like dimples or divots in its yeah. shell too. Yeah. Oh, this is my hand. That color changes my hand reflecting on its body. <laughs> to be clear, I was really confused for a moment. Like, what is it doing? And I was like, no, what am I doing? <laughs> uh, thanks, Lars, for the super heart, and Georgie for the great discussion award. Um, yeah, it's really fun to have Georgia and Rebecca here to take a look at this and. Um, yeah, lots of little, um, I forget the scientific name for those, but there's a name for when there's little divots like that. Punctures, sometimes we call them on. Is it so they have more surface area? Um, Is that why they would happen? I'm not sure. Yeah. Um, it, are the antennas outside of the exoskeleton or are they inside the exoskeleton? It, um, they're also covered by the exoskeleton. Yeah, it's all one continuous exoskeleton that even goes in to their in through their mouth and then up, like because they just have to be completely protected, you know. So, sorry, let me zoom back out. So this one actually, I think, turned back golden again. I think mm -hmm. maybe, maybe I need to bother it more because I feel like it never fully turned red. <laughs> Maybe one or the other one now. Is the other yeah. one not changed? So Georgia, Georgia was here when I, we first found these. Um, and I do want to give, uh, uh, Frank, this is not the new equipment yet. I meant to open it this weekend, but then I was like, I just needed a break from live broadcasting. So didn't haven't opened it yet. But I will let you know. It'll be in the title of that broadcast. Um. Yeah, uh, so Georgia was here when we found them on the Morning Glory plant outside, and this the one beetle like never turned re never turned red. I think that's the one on the right here. It just stayed golden even though we like 
kind of bothered it by taking it off the leaf and bringing it inside to save for a broadcast like this. So it might just be a very chill, chilled out golden tortoise beetle. Because that was like a couple of days ago. And we were like, is it like just dying or something? But it's still alive and just yeah. refuses to change color. Yeah. So, yeah. So two two other things I want to do with you guys and everyone here today is see their, look at um, one of their like flip one over so you can see its face because I think that they're, they're the most adorable looking little aliens. Like they're just really cute. And their feet are really cute too. A lot of beetles have really, especially um, leaf beetles like them, they're in the family Chrysomelody, which is the leaf beetle family. Um, they have really cute feet that sometimes have like a lot of little like like, decor like decorative looking like hairs on them and I don't know. Um, and yeah, so I'll see if I can, I'll disturb this one by flipping it over, I guess. <laughs> yeah, go for it. Take a look. Okay. okay. Um, so. While you're doing that, I guess I'll comment, the title is of this cast is Create the Habitat and they will show. So I bought a, as Isa mentioned, their host plant is the Morning Glory. And we bought a Morning Glory plant from like the co-op and it was like less than a week before they showed up before, I think, before we found them, so. So my question is, what kind yeah. of more glory? Does it matter? That's a great question. And that's something that I need to do some digging around to like get more information on. And that I even tried to do earlier this morning before this broadcast, I wanted to see if I could get a list of all the um, Morning Glory family native species. So I could see <laughs> what, potentially all of their host plants are because that's mm -hmm. um uh this one's like so like kind of lethargic even i feel like while it's on its back should we talk about it but it doesn't seem in a hurry to flip back exactly <laughs> well, um my uh, question also is like one of the native um like morning glory type plants we have around here that uh, are bindweed and they yeah. have a white flower and they like pop up everywhere in my garden. And I was wondering if they would show up on that. I'll have to start looking and see. Yeah. But I don't know if it's a morning glory per se, but it looks like a morning glory. So I haven't yeah. looked up a scientific name or anything. So yeah, um, keep an eye out. Um, that's definitely, yeah, the, the bindweed is one of the ones that I believe is native. Yeah. And Okay. Um, if you look on it, you'll look, you'll look for holes, like almost like Swiss cheese sort of holes on the leaves. And they're usually hanging out on the underside of the leaf. So if you find a hole with leaves, just like go sneak over and then flip it over or look under if you can and then see if you see one. Sometimes they'll be on the top of the leaf, but Many of, most of the time, I've found them underneath the leaf. And then also you'll see spots of um, their poop too, which, oops, sorry, I bumped this, which we call frass. It's a science, uh, entomology term for insect poop is frass. And let me get the focus back here. This one's like just chillaxin. <laughs> um, all right, bye, Frank. Thanks for coming by to say hi. Good to have you here. Have a good time at work. Um, and uh, yeah, so they, their frass will be on the leaf, and even um, at certain times times of the year, their eggs will be on the leaves, and the and the eggs look a lot like their frass, which is probably not a coincidence. <laughs> I think that they disguise their poop to their eggs to look like their poop, so that it's safer and like. I, uh, bait sand mimicry, I suppose, or I don't know what you'd call it. What do you? What would we call that, Georgia? <laughs> you know, I don't know of a term for like. I wouldn't. I guess you could consider. I guess you could consider it like bait sand mimicry, if you had to pick between Mullerian mimicry, where you're actually dangerous, and bait sand, where you're like pretending to be dangerous. I guess it would be, you're pretending to be dangerous or gross. <laughs> yeah, I wonder. I wonder if anyone's yeah coined a term or like really acknowledged that sort of thing. Because it's one thing. There's so many. Yeah. I guess it would be more camouflage than mimicry, maybe, because poop is like yeah, part true. of the environment. Yeah. You're camouflaging with. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, a lot of insects and organisms camouflage with leaves, and even with 
other animals poop like a lot of caterpillars when they're very young they look like bird poop for example like the black swallowtail mm -hmm. which commonly is found on like parsley or dill and then as they get bigger and they're not poop sized anymore they change like with the as they molt into those other larger forms they'll they'll take other they'll, they'll um, enter into other strategies of camouflage like they'll just blend in with the plant and turn green then but i don't know i i'm very curious about how many insects camouflage as their own poop i haven't thought about that so much until now i wonder how common or uncommon it is yeah oh we have a question here from jane saying hi jane how can you keep them off your flowers naturally if you want flowers to grow uh, yeah, it's a great question, and that's something that often comes up when it comes to gardening because we have all these insects that are eating the plants, and then we have all, all these plants that we want to grow and beautiful flowers that we want to enjoy. And uh, my answer for you is that um, I think, well, it depends on, are you thinking of these? First of all, are you thinking of this insect specifically? Or are there other insects that you're thinking of when you're talking about helping to maintain your flowers? Because um, one thing about these are, are that they are a native species and so they are in balance with nature. And so if you have them on your plant, they probably won't get to a threshold or a level where they are like really take, like affecting and bringing down the health of your plant. Um, it's probably, unless something else is wrong with your plant. Sometimes insects like the Eastern tent caterpillar, they really cause a lot of defoliation, but they are totally native. And they're only, many times they're only gonna completely um, diminish a plant if the plant's already injured or stressed in some other way. So that's one thing to consider. Another thing I'd, I encourage you to consider is um, growing, the flowers and plants in your garden as growing your garden as a garden of life rather than just a garden of flowers and plants because there's a lot of beautiful animals like the golden tortoise beetle uh, to be enjoyed and to um, make your plant uh, just to enjoy in your garden as well. Yeah, and, and beetles, I, I did a thing recently on pollinator, pollinating gardens and pollinators. And um, if you're into pollinators and there are less of them now. Beetles are a pollinator. And um, all they do is eat a little hole in the side of the flower and they get in there and um, they get in there at night and they refer to that as the love hotel for mm -hmm. beetles. And they're very good pollinators. They roll around in the but, pollen. But not just beetles specifically, right? But a lot of beetles, I just beetles yeah, in yeah. general that are pollinating beetles, they mm -hmm. get in there at night, so you don't see them in there during the day. And then they come out at night and then mm -hmm. they carry the pollen to other flowers because that's that's what beetles do. So yeah. And I will I will say too, like the morning glory that these beetles were taken from is like a beautiful morning glory with pink flowers and like big pink flowers and it's really pretty. And um, we haven't noticed any bad effects on the morning glory from the beetles. Um, I would say if anything, because these beetles are so pretty, they just add to the beauty of the plant because you have these golden beetles and these red flowers and it's kind of cool. Yeah. Yeah, you see this really cool shiny speck on the leaf. So it's then you have the, um, oops, sorry, I'm trying to like flip this other one over too. Then you have the beautiful like purple and pink flowers along with golden specks on the leaves, which is pretty cool. I totally disturbed this one and it's turning red now. The one that I just flipped over. It's not not as chill as the other one. But you can see how people oftentimes will mistake in these as ladybugs because uh, they have those six spots and they're red. And so I didn't even think about that. Sometimes when you're in a certain field, like you just don't, these things go over your head because you're so just like, you just don't even think about it. And so it took other people seeing it to be like, oh, it looks like a ladybug. And I was like, oh my gosh, like, I wonder if they're even, I wonder if they like intentionally have become mimics of ladybugs because ladybugs are aposematically colored. They have warning colorations. They have these toxins that they 
it's like they just have nasty chemicals that make them unplatable to other to other organisms eating them and so it's advantageous for this tortoise beetle to also display those colors yeah so that for sure is batesian mimicry right it's pretending to be something dangerous but the the golden tortoise shell beetle is not toxic itself yeah. is that correct yeah the golden tortoise beetle i to tell the truth i don't really know um I think it's non-toxic because of the way that it lives. Like as a larva, it also is just green and just holds a fecal shield over its head um, as camouflage, which, which suggests that it's probably edible. However, it is on a plant that is not, that does have toxins for people. So I suspect that it is harmless for things that want to eat it. But I also don't fully know, and I actually I think that I poisoned myself with the morning glory plant when I was keeping a colony of them by not properly washing my hands after pulling off pieces of the morning glory to feed the colony. So, yeah, learned that lesson the hard way. I had no idea what was going on, and then all of a sudden I was like, oh my gosh! Like it all the pieces came together, and I was like, these stomach cramps that I'm having like have to be. It fits the description of things that happen um, from the toxins of morning glory or nightshade, or no, morning glory nightshade is different, right? I think I don't know. I need to learn my plants a little better. <laughs> um, I think morning glories are part of the nightshade family. Yeah. Like, okay. And there's, I think, also a different thing within that family that's like nightshade specifically that's like very toxic. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Right. Um, and uh, supposedly the seeds will give you hallucinogenic effect and also kill you possibly. So, yeah. yeah. Be careful. Um, yeah. Be careful. Uh, David's asking, are there other tortoise beetles with transparent elytra? So, so everyone knows elytra are the wing coverings. So with the golden tortoise beetle, these are such chill golden tortoise beetles. Normally, oftentimes I'm like chasing them around the container, like trying to keep them from flying away. So it's pretty amazing how chill these ones are. <laughs> um, yeah, so these, I'm gonna point them out right here on either side, like the, the shells or the coverings of the wings, um, those are the elytra and they protect the functional wings, which are the second pair of wings. And I don't, the answer is, oh yeah, there are some other ones with transparent elytra, like the mottled tortoise beetles one that's also in the area that has somewhat transparent elytra, different pattern, not golden, it's more brown and um, but yeah, so, uh, so yeah, let's see, there's some other questions here. Um, yeah, so I mean, one thing you can do, Jane, too, is you can, you can, like, maybe pick them off your plant to d deter them and put them on another plant, or you can plant more than one morning glory, one that's dedicated to having the tortoise beetles on them, and one other one, you just pick them off and put them on the other plant. I don't know, that's probably not a very satisfactory answer, but uh, one thing that I like to say, especially when it comes to growing herbs, for example, like with um, when I when I plant parsley or fennel or something like that, I try to double how much I want so that some of it I can be I can let go and give to the butterflies and the caterpillars, and then the other half I'm like, all right, I'm taking this this part set aside for me. So um, things to consider as you make decisions in a garden. Okay. Um, so another question here is, um, thanks knowledge, it is a pretty cool insect. Um, but do they eat the leaf or flower too? In this case, the golden tortoise beetles only eat the leaves. Yeah, they just eat the leaves. I'm gonna zoom on to its foot. This is little tortoise beetle foot. And you can see the two tarsal claws in the front, which help give it grip. All insects have a, like a kind of a default body plan of having two tarsal claws. And that's why when people hold an insect, it feels a little pokey. Um, it's because the tarsal claws are 
like digging into your skin a little bit. Not something to be like alarmed about. It's not, you're not being attacked. It's just what, it's just their version of fingernails or fingers. Um, so uh, some, some of them can be a little poopy than others, depending on how they live their life. Like that's why a bunch of the larger beetles have like huge, like bang looking like tarsal claws because they're wrap their arms are wrapped around like bark and branches for part of their lives. So they need to be heavier. But other ones have small, small little tarsal claws like the golden tortoise beetle because they're just walking around on leaves, which is a more um uh like a easier to navigate surface, I'd say. I haven't had personal experience with that, but <laughs> yeah. Anyway. So this other one is still just lying on its back. Hopefully it's okay. It kind of makes me wonder if it's like been affected by something, like some toxins or something like that. But see what I mean? It's just still there. Oh, it's, it's continuing I'm, to hang on though. It's been kind of like this for days, right? Yeah, yeah. When we first found it, it was like this. So. Let me see if they want some water. Do you want some water? I don't know. I don't know. It's really its legs now that I picked it up. But it's just. It is kind of amazing that, they, that we found them too because the morning glory plant that we had bought, like I mentioned, we had just bought it like a week ago or something, but it was also like in a container by itself on our on our second floor deck. So it's not like it was in the middle of a garden with tons of other flowers and plants around. And like somehow the these beetles found the morning glory really quickly and mm -hmm. came to hang out with us. So. Yeah. Yeah. It was only a couple of days. And yeah, so thanks for bringing that up, Georgia, because um, bringing up the title and making sure we incorporate that because, um, yeah, the, the one thing that I really also want to get across besides how awesome tortoise beetles are is that because they're the fastest reversibly color changing arthropod known to man. And if you're in the Eastern area of the USA and some other parts too, I think they their range goes into Central America too, um, then you have the opportunity to welcome them into your space. And if you create the habitat, if you put their host plant out there, they'll probably show up. And that's exactly what happened with us here. Um, on our roof deck where we put the plant out and then a couple days later it doesn't it's not always that fast sometimes you have to be a little patient but we lucked out yeah I think last summer we also put morning glory out and I don't remember if we ever found any last year but it was also a different type of morning glory I think yeah we did I did find one last year and we also found another species as well which I think the model tortoise beetle also showed up and we also have like tons of thistle beetle tortoise beetles in our front yard too which look the same except they are green they're an opaque green really blended with thistle um unfortunately they are an invasive species however they also eat the invasive thistle although unfortunately they probably also eat native thistles as well but um, because of that like i'm um like i ideally would have all native plants in the yard here but I also like have a really soft spot for tortoise beetles, even if they're not native. So I have a hard time pulling out all the thistle because they're just such cute little beetles. <laughs> um, actually, uh, if I know that you're leaving soon, Georgia, to come back, but I can run outside to the garden and grab a tortoise beetle larva if you guys want to see that before we wrap this up. Yeah, thumbs up. Okay, cool. Because they're really cool too. They're, the larval situation is partially like also, it also contributes to why they're one of my favorite species because of their fecal shield. So be right back. I guess I can, we can talk for a little <laughs> bit. Um, do you have any, I guess, so my mom, Rebecca here is a master gardener and used to do a lot of landscaping and stuff too. So do you have like, tips for growing morning glories or like well, morning glories um basically they're one of the seeds that you need to stratify and so you need a cold period and mm -hmm. it helps if you 
scratch the seed and soak it in some water okay. before you plant it. So to have it. the seed needs to go through like a period of being cold before it will grow. Like mm -hmm. maybe people need to keep it in their fridge or something. Yeah. Okay. And then scratch the seeds before you plant them. Mm -hmm. And then do you know, like off the top of your head, do morning glories need like a lot of sun or a lot of water or usually like sun. Mm -hmm. I mean, I would say they're more sun. Um, and, um, I feel like the morning glory on our porch has to be watered all the time, but I don't know if that's cause it's kind of high up and like in the wind a lot or. Yeah. Well, it's also hot there on your roof there. It's like pretty hot. Yeah. And, oh. um, if you plant it in the ground, you wouldn't need to water it that much. I am yeah. not much of a waterer. I try <laughs> to plant things that are more native and because I hate the water. Yeah. <laughs> but when you put things in pots, you always have to water them a lot more. So, so um, there's a question. I have seeds. Is it too late? I don't know, Jane. Um, where where are you in the country, roughly? Um, I think. Sorry, we have some noisy cars going by. Um, like, would it be too late to plant morning glory here in India? Okay. I I think the ones that come in the packages, you can plant them right away. I okay. think you can. But like, is really. it too late in the summer to plant them now? No. Okay. No. No, because they'll be they'll they'll be continuously blooming until it gets cold. Yeah. Ooh, how long does it take to germinate? Oh, Jane is in New York. I don't know. I often I think you can look up that kind of stuff for seeds, and it might depend on the type of morning glory. Yeah, I'm not sure about that. Yeah. You know, like maybe two weeks, ten days. I'm look, not sure. We have a the larvae. Oh. Okay, so this to be clear, this is not the larva of a golden tortoise beetle. This is the larva of a, the closely related thistle tortoise beetle. And the larva is pretty flat on the leaf here. And then what's blurry and what it's, what's over its head is its beautiful fecal shield, which, sorry, my phone is not cooperating. Yeah, there it's we okay. Go. Looks like there's some fresh fecal matter on the top too, all beautiful and shiny. Happy Monday, everybody. <laughs> um, and so it holds this fecal shield over its body using um, like that. It's the, the back of it, the end of it. And uh, it's a mix of um, frass, so insect poop, and then also exoskeleton, shed exoskeleton as well. Mm. So and it's focusing um, on the leaf again. Which one's the front and which one's the back? Yeah, which way is the, the is the head toward this, the top of the screen, Isa? Or yeah, great question. The head is right. I can't think of it. Head's on the lower side. The head is okay. right. Okay. Like there, right down there. Okay. And it's really like in defensive mode right now. Um, there's mm -hmm. one over here that dropped its fecal shield, which I, I'll show you guys all too. As a comparison, so here's the dropped fecal shield. I think it kind of, I don't know what happened, how it dropped it, but here's the little larva itself. Did it decide, like, it's like, I'm gonna run instead of try to like hide and be defensive, so it like dropped the extra weight. And it's yeah, maybe, <laughs> <laughs> I don't really know. <laughs> uh, let me move this closer. But you can, yeah, see its body a little better. It's probably running under the leaf right now. So you can see its face up there. You can see it has little tiny antennal nubs on its face as well. I think that all the spikes along its body are like a sort of, oh, you can see it's, I think we call that its anal fork in the back there, which holds up the, yeah. the fecal shield. Normally we don't really get to see that. So it's actually really cool that um, amazing. everyone, we're privileged with viewing the anal fork of this. <laughs> It's quite cool, yeah. <laughs> yep, there it is. Wow, it's pretty cool. <laughs> yeah. uh, the way it's so zigzaggy. So that's what it uses to hold up that shield. <clears throat> and I like to call them zero waste beetles as well because of the way <laughs> that they like, just pile up all their exoskeleton and fecal matter on to that shield area. Um, <laughs> very thrifty. Uh, so yeah, and they just kind of blend in and let me zoom in more. I can't zoom in up too much more, but 
You can kind of see right through its exoskeleton too. So I wonder if that's its like digestive tract or something. But yeah, all the appendages on the side I think are for defense. Um, it's in, interestingly some uh, caterpillars also have a very very similar body form, specifically in the lima coated slug mm -hmm. moth caterpillar group, which and, it, and also specifically and. Maybe coincidentally, since the, I I have declared tortoise beetles my favorite insect, the lima coated slug moth caterpillar in the genus Isa has a, is one of those ones that looks as a larva a lot like the golden tortoise beetle larva. So I wonder, are, with all the appendages on the side, are they trying to look like centipedes or something? Maybe. Um, yeah. So I'm not. I'm not. That's actually, it's a good question because it almost looks a bit like an isopod, even the way that it is. Uh, I, I don't know. I also I wonder if it if it works to keep. I wonder if it works to like maybe seem like trichomes. Even trichomes are those hairs on plants. So I wonder if it is it forms and kind of gets sensed as like a trichome from a passing ant or something like that so kind of like you know spears all around its body to keep something from coming closer and realizing that it's food and like touching its main body and realizing it's food i wonder um yeah a lot of things to wonder about here uh Georgie's saying they may use the poop shield in a defensive manner. Yeah, so that, that they hold over their body so that if something maybe tries to eat them or come into contact with them, they'll come into the contact with the poop shield first. Or from above, you just see the speck of the poop, the fecal shield, and it just looks like not something that's not edible. So, yeah. Um, yeah, well, and Georgie Boy also said earlier, maybe the shield is a distraction. Like, I think maybe that comment was made when it was running away from its, when it had dropped its poop shield. Oh, in that case. Maybe, yeah, like maybe <laughs> it's gonna invest, something's going to investigate the abandoned yeah. shield. Oh, I see. Yeah, I think it's possible. I, it's very, I think it's pretty uncommon for them to drop their shield like that. They put a lot of work into it. <laughs> um, also, I was thinking that I want, there's also the, idea that the poop shield can help. Oh, I think this might be some of it too. I wonder if the poop shield can help with um, like an umbrella almost sometimes from desiccation. Oh, look, there's some new poop coming out, everybody. Wow, we can see it lining its 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 anal fork with some fresh poop. This is the beginning. We're seeing this is really the amazing. We're seeing the birth of a new fecal shield here, right? Live on the bug scope, everybody. <laughs> Maybe the old one was just too heavy, you know? It was time to start again. Yeah, I don't know. Um, I was thinking, yeah, that maybe the the poop fecal shield helps with uh, thermodynamics because it's this dark mass over its body that can maybe help protect it from desiccation. Because interestingly, these... Larvae are on the surface of the leaf oftentimes, and it gets really hot during the day. I was going to say, yeah, it might also help keep protect them from the sunlight or something. Is like UV a problem? Yeah, I, I think so, Georgia, because they have much thinner exoskeletons too than adults or other insects, uh, which can come into play in some ways. And larvae and Insect larvae tend to be much softer because they have a lot of eating to do and a lot of growing to do. So if they have a harder exoskeleton, it makes it harder for them. It's just a lot more energy put into making that exoskeleton and it makes it harder to, um, it's just more cost um, costly to have a tougher exoskeleton. And um, thanks, Molly. Yeah, this nominate this for the broadcast of the week, you guys. Tag Peter and Paolo, Pablo so they can see this beautiful anal fork and the birth of a new <laughs> fecal shield right here on HAPS. <laughs> yeah, it's really, I really have never seen this. This is one thing that I love about doing these like live broadcasts is that um, oftentimes we'll come across things that like I otherwise 
probably wouldn't have seen. But then here we are watching bugs for a while, and then we see some. There's an insect on it. I or, saw that like, like a, a mite. Yeah. What is it? Oh, what is that? Hmm. I don't know what that is. I always think it's cool how, like, on some of the shiny, like, scarab beetles, at least in Michigan, um, I've seen little mites on them that are also shiny, like the beetle, you know what I mean? It's like the same, like, if I, it was like, it wasn't a golden tortoise shell beetle, but something shiny like that, and then it had a little golden shiny mite on it, too, this beetle I found once, so. Oh, cool. Yeah, I have no idea what that was that crawled around there. At first, I was going to guess it was a clembola or a springtail bug, but then it didn't really move the way that the springtails do. So, um, David, are you, are you remarking on that little tiny arthropod that we just saw looking like a larva too? Yeah, I wonder if it's some sort of weird like triangulate insect thing, which, anyway. Um, I wanted to say that with the new scope, it goes up to 180 times magnification, which is huge. So when something like this happens in the future, where we have a tiny bug on a bug, we will have more. Oh, here, let me see if I can zoom in on it here. Um, Isa, I have to go because I have to start oh, right. going back to Michigan if I'm going to return the rental car in time. Oh, yes, yes, yes. <laughs> uh, I will leave you to your online students. Oh, and I think I think I'll wrap it up. I think I'll wrap it up now. Yeah, I think we saw a lot today. It's a lot to take in here, everybody. So <laughs> we will end on this note. Um, I've got some things to think about on the drive back. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I'll end on a with a golden tortoise beetle on the screen for us, so we can go back to the shiny, the shiny and glorious, glamorous adults. You really um, took us. On a, on a trip there. That's true. You think we come for the gold. Beetles and then, then we were watching beetles poop, poop on themselves. Yeah, live beetle pooping and fecal shield creation here on Hops. Woohoo! Okay. Um, it's so pretty. Yeah, so here we'll end where we started with the golden tortoise beetle adult chill on its yummy, tasty home plant leaf and yeah, thanks for joining Rebecca and Georgia. It was really fun having you here and chatting about these things. It was a lot of fun. Yeah, thanks for showing Thank us you. the Beatles. Bye, everybody. Yeah, sure. Bye. Bye. Take care. Yeah, thanks everyone for joining the broadcast today. Make sure you subscribe, like the broadcast, share with your friends, um, whoever needs a little bit of shine in their life or um surprise with the fecal shields so <laughs> whichever way you want to go with it um and stay tuned for thursday when we have our regularly scheduled bug scope and then also next tuesday is our i think fourth episode of sips and spiders with sebastian and Slodge. so all right take care everybody bye